Near the end, I will actually talk about the new lab that he's mentioning and that you guys are apparently drafted to talk to high school students. I didn't realize high school students had such a short attention span, but uh, you can see it here in detail and then you'll actually know what you're looking at later. So I thought uh, for today I would talk to you about something that's device related and then roll over into some ion solid physics, which is what we do over in the physics department in my laboratories. Uh, only to justify my participation in the RE program because otherwise it's kind of weird that there's a physicist sitting in this uh, otherwise engineering oriented uh, RE. So if you feel like Nathan's out of place, he probably feels that way too. So, um, so just to outline, someone got, told me once never to put an outline up, but I ignored them. So uh, the outline is, um, I'll talk about a specific kind of device which is called a magnetic tunnel junction device. Um, and a little bit about memory based on magnetic devices. Then that'll give me a reason to talk about ion solid physics. Um, and then a specific kind of ion, which is the one that we're making in the new lab over in Kiner, which is a highly charged ion, or an HCI. I didn't change the font, so don't get thrown off. Some people think that's hydrochloric acid or something. That's an I. And then uh, talk a bit, roll back to the magnetic tunnel junctions and talk about how you can actually modify those with uh, those ions to make a different kind of device. And then finally, the thing that you're going to see on Thursday and talk to these high schoolers, or at least I'll talk to the high schoolers about, is the CUE bit laboratory. And feel free, uh, I don't get thrown off that easily, so if there's a question that comes up or whatever, just ask me something. Okay, I don't mind. So magnetic uh, junction devices, uh, you'll see them in uh, those of you who have laptops open and those of you like me who have a cell phone in your pocket or whatever. Uh, magnetic memory. Um, is uh, by and large nowadays based on some, the need for ultra high density magnetic recording. So if we want things to get smaller and faster then we have to rely on other factors and materials and so one of those is magnetism and specifically as a physicist would say that's r due to the spin of the electron. So this is a little bit of discussion about spin. And so if you want to do this uh, it doesn't matter how more tightly you pack memory onto some sort of hard disk or whatever sort of memory thing you have, you need to be able to read it uh, off of that thing. Otherwise, you're kind of wasting your time packing it tighter and tighter. And so you need ultra-sensitive ways to read things, and not even just ultra-sensitive in terms of spatial resolution, but also in terms of speed. Uh, so one route to that is to use magnetoresistive heads. So there's two types, giant magnetoresistance uh, and then tunneling magnetoresistance. And so I want to talk first about giant magnetoresistance. Um, so the way to think about giant magnetoresistance is uh, we're relying on the spin and say it's a three layer device that we're relying on as a memory element or, or as a read head and we want to determine whether the electrons that have gone through this device are spin up or spin down. And so what you can do is make a device that has a ferromagnet, a normal metal and a ferromagnet in a, a triple layer such that you basically only allow the spin up electrons that come on to this device to go from the left to the right. Whereas the spin down electrons are not really the preferred orientation inside this ferromagnet or this ferromagnet and so they get scattered. Another way to think about that is in terms of a resistor diagram is that spin ups have small resistance paths, spin down have high resistance path. Okay. Um, the opposite configuration then is that you flip the orientation of one of these ferromagnetic layers such that both spin orientations find it, at least on one of the ferromagnetic layers, is not the preferred orientation. So in terms of resistor, you end up with uh, high resistance, high resistance in both paths. So you end up with a, basically a different resistance state by flipping one of these layers in this little, this little read head or this little device. And so you can tell that I've let through one spin or I've let through no spins. So you become sensitive then to spin. So this is the basic idea of a magnetoresistance device. If we want to then transition that over to tunneling magnetic resistance, then we're talking about tunneling. So this is quantum mechanics physics problem. And uh, I don't know everyone's background, but I'm assuming that th most of you haven't taken quantum mechanics, but you probably know the idea of tunneling, which is something wants to go from here to here, and it shouldn't be allowed to pass between those two points, yet because it's a quantum mechanical object, it can. And usually it can because you get it close enough, and then you align the conditions correctly. Okay. It doesn't mean you can walk through walls. Of course, if you wait long enough, I guess you could, but that's the age of the universe or something. So what we're really talking about is take two ferromagnetic magnets, and instead of putting a normal metal between them like we did in the previous slide, let's put an insulator there. So as we know, an insulator doesn't want to conduct electricity, doesn't want to conduct electrons, 
And so this is basically an, a non-allowed region for those spin charges to make it through. But they will make it through if this device is made small enough and constructed properly. And so you end up with then a tunneling device. We'll go from the upper contact to the lower contact by tunneling between these two ferromagnets. So the way to see this is that we end up with two states. And so this diagram is a, kind of a solid state physics diagram, but the beginning is this little picture here. And it's, it's, it's similar to the giant magnetoresistance case, which is imagine we have two, two ferromagnet layers which are oriented in the same direction. And then, so one of the ferromagnets, we'll call them one, the other one is two, has then a dominant state of electrons inside it which is spin down. This is a called a density of states diagram, but it basically says the most, the, most of the electrons you find inside this material are going to be spin down. Okay? And then your other ferromagnet, as you can see, is also oriented spin down, so most of the electrons are there. So when you actually do get tunneling between these two, I have this thick red arrow, you're going to get dominantly tunneling of spin down electrons between those two. Okay? Whereas here you go from minor component to minor component, so you have this small arrow. Okay? So we end up then with a, a large current of spin down electrons between these two. Then if you go into an anti-parallel state, what you can see is it's a little bit different than the giant magnetoresistance case, but essentially the same idea, but now we go from down to up, and you see that we have a dominant case going to a minor case on this side, we have a minor case going to a dominant case on this side. So we still get a difference in effective resistance between the two. It looks like neither one of these arrows I've drawn is big and fat, right? So we basically get sort of equal of the two as opposed to dominant of the down in the previous side. All right? So then there's a measure of this, which is uh, just this tunneling magneto resistance measure, which, uh, you know, it's 1045, we don't have to do a lot of math. It's just uh, these R's refer to the resistance between the two, of the two states. So we're basically looking at the difference between going between them divided by the resistance of one of them. But you can really look at this and just say it's related to the spin of the ferromagnets, okay? And so what we're looking then is that these P's, this is basically related to the polarization of these two states. So when I say polarization, I mean one of them was pointed down, that's down polarized. The other one was pointed up, that's up polarized. And if we look at this, you can see that as these P's in this equation go to one, then physicists love stuff like this, you divide by zero. So the tunneling magnetic resistance goes to infinity, okay? So this, that looks like the, the optimum case is you have high tunneling meter resistance. So I'm very sensitive to a resistance which is then driven by the polarization of the two levels. So if I can get the levels to be highly polarized, I have a really different, uh, high difference between the, the resistance in one state versus the other. So, because all we're trying to do is make sure we can tell the difference between the two. And then we've basically been able to do what you do in memory, which is one thing is different than the other, so that's a zero or a one. So the basic idea of memory. So the, the deal with tunnel and your resistive devices and the, the reason you don't actually find them in, in our cell phones and stuff right now, uh, in a large part, is, is, re, is because they have intrinsically large resistance. That's because it's related to tunneling. And as I said, t tunneling is not something you expect to have happen. Um, and so that ultimately makes it hard for these events to actually occur. So it becomes high resistance, low probability events. Um, you also have a limited operating frequency. As I said, that if you're going to make a memory element, you've got to make it fast and high density. Um, this is related to what's called the resistance area product. And if you can actually get the resistance area product, the product of the area of the device that you built and the resistance to get small, then you can actually make your device really fast. You can switch back and forth. Um, now, this relates creates some problems in terms of noise, but what it also creates problems are, as if remember, that we want the resistance to be high, right? So we can tell the difference between spin up and spin down. But if I want the resistance area product to go down, then the only way I can get that RA product to go down if I want R to go up is to make the area really small, okay? And so now you've automatically gone into a situation where you're like, oh, I gotta make these devices and I gotta make them tiny, okay? So, this is a constraint then on using this thing as a sensing head, is making it small, making it uh, impervious to noise, and then also making it fast enough. So how do we speed it up? So we basically need a breakthrough in, in low resistance barrier fabrication. Okay? So we need to be able to modify the barrier uh, in some way to, to change its resistance. So we can sort of cheat the tunneling <coughs> problem a little bit because 
Um, we still want to have this difference between the two levels show up in the resistance, but we want the barrier to be tunable. So there have been attempts to do this. Um, this is not that new, but the, so you can see then, here's the materials that show up in these sort of devices. Uh, so this is cobalt on both sides and iron, so that's something that's ferromagnet, and this is something that's got an oxygen in it, so there's an insulator between the two. So this is your, this is your ferromagnet insulator, ferromagnet material. And people have actually been able to show that they can get ultra low uh, resistance area products. <clears throat> Uh, they've also done some, some cute stuff with plasma oxidation, so there, there's a whole industry of people using different attempts. So the one that, that's a different approach and that sort of gets into what we do over in physics is to use ions. And so this is uh, what I want to talk about now is, is how would ion beams or ion solid interactions play out in our ability to sort of tune some piece of material. So we want to spend a little bit of time now talking then about what am, what am I talking about when I talk about ions. So this is a switch in topics then. So we're going to talk about energetic ions and the ones that you see in any engineering lab or certainly in industry and guarantee you 99% of the time if you go out and talk to someone about that you're doing ion beams, they'll assume automatically that it's singly charged ions. Okay, that's just sort of the easiest thing to make out there. It's what's shining in the lights, you know, doing uh, some radiative recombination in the lights above you. Uh, it's just the sort of standard thing that people do. Um, and when you deal with these ions, then the dominant way that you interact with materials, if you take a beam of these ions and you fire them into some surface layer, some thin film, some material, is it's kinetic energy. Okay, so that's just the energy of motion. This thing bangs into the other thing. So that's the dominant mechanism. And so if you look then at the probability, say, of that ion doing something, and this is a probability of it actually bouncing off the surface, as a function of the energy of the beam that comes in. So, we can quiz Nathan. Do you know what the energy of a thermal room temperature is? So, so uh, room temperature, uh, so the gas in this room is about 0 0.025 EVs. So that's what this dashed line is here. So this is, this is uh, if you had ions which are the same temperature as the gas in the room that's around us, they'd lie right here. And as you can see, it's a very low probability that they'll scatter. A very high probability that they'll do something like this, which is these, both of these words have absorption at the end of them. One is physisorption, they physically stick, and chemisorption, they actually chemically bond. But in either way, what they're talking about is that they stuck to the surface. Okay? So the, this is the region where if I take a clean piece of metal and I was to lay it in the room, in less than a nanosecond or so, it would be covered in whatever's in the room, nitrogen, oxygen, and stuff like that. So this is the dominant chemistry that happens here. If you go higher in energy, you get up past this peak, which is where things actually bounce, and then they turn into something else, which is implantation. So that now you actually say, all right, I've got a lot of energy, but what am I going to do? I'm going to blow right through this thing and just implant inside. And so in terms of the industry and semiconductor physics, this is what happens if you want to actually, say, take a piece of silicon and dope it so that it's uh, N-type or P-type. You shoot ions into it. Okay. So the problem with this plot is, although that it's basically qualitatively true, is that it tells you that there's a narrow range where you can actually do something to modify a thin film. Because you're either going to stick to the surface, you're going to blow through it, or you're going to bounce off of it and transfer some energy when you bounce. But you don't have a lot of control here in terms of the kinetic energy. Okay? Um, and especially if you're, say, making a device that has a thin film, and you try to crank up this energy, you're actually going to go and damage something underneath the thin film. You're also going to damage this thing in another way, which is called sputtering, because you're actually going to impart so much energy classically, you're going to bounce into the surface that you're actually going to knock stuff off, and you're going to throw things out of the surface as well. So this is uh, a machine gun basically firing in to the solid target, um, but it has uses. So if you, if you overlap ever in your future careers with ion-solid interactions, and It'll be singly charged unless we're super successful at Clemson and everyone buys a highly charged ion beam line for a million dollars, which I doubt, is that you'll see these things show up as in thin film deposition, etching. Um, even if you switch over into chemistry uh, and, and want to measure biological systems, people will talk about something called SIMS. It's not a video game. Um, it's actually a secondary ion mass spectrometry where you actually say, take some target and you're like, I wonder what's on this thing. And you hit it with ions and you, let, you knock off what, and, and then you record whatever comes off, which are the secondaries, the secondary ions that bounce off. And you say, oh, now I know what it is. I've measured its mass. And it's, 
it's uh, nicotine and it's because my students smoke too much. Uh, Nathan knows what I'm talking about. So this is a general picture of what I'm talking about is that you're shooting a beam of particles into this sample and you're just going to throw stuff out. And this is not necessarily what you want to have happen. Now this turns out to be a very useful technique. People have done this to write lines on surfaces and make nanostructures this way. So um, it's been done to death. Um, and the physics is, is pretty simple. So I'll just spend a couple of slides talking about it. Is that you basically come in and in terms of the microscopics, your incident ion ends up hitting another one and then this is a problem from your physics one class where this hits that at a certain angle, this goes that way to conserve momentum and then you basically just do this all the way through the solid. Okay, so it's called a collision cascade and it just basically each, each particle that picked up energy goes through its own set of collisions into the target and then there's just some probability that somebody's going to get bounced back out and that's why you get sputtering out of the target. Um, you can actually do this Again, this is what, it's getting closer to lunch, so you should be able to do math. Um, but I won't make you do math. Uh, but this is a, a factor which would actually tell you how much energy you uh, actually trans transfer. It's just a kinematic factor, and believe it or not, I should give this as a homework problem to you, because you should be able to solve this. It's about a one page of math. Um, but it's related to the mass ratio of the two things that you send in, and the total scattering angle, which is, if I come in like this, the total scattering angle is, through what angle did I get scattered? Okay, so if I got scattered all the way back that way, then that's 180 degrees. So that the energy imparted in collision is just how much energy I lose, it's how much I brought in times one minus this kinematic factor, and you can do a reality check, is if you come back at 180 degrees for equal masses, anybody play pool? Anybody? Anybody play pool? So you've done this, pool ball, dink, comes back at you. This guy kind of just sits there, right? Yeah, so that's this uh, k equals zero situation, basically, two balls just like that. So this is why that I try to recruit grad students who play pool, apparently. Um, so as I said, there's limit, limitations to using these ions if you wanted to do something like device physics, because you'll actually implant, uh, you'll, you'll end up relying on a lot of like simple classical uh, physics. So the other route to take is to find a new kind of ion so that you have a new knob to turn. So this is why we uh, talk about highly charged ions is because they have not just kinetic energy but potential. Okay, So it's basically like not just sending in a little packet that's going to bounce around but it's a little packet that's basically got some explosives on it. Okay, So think of it that way. And it's stored potential energy. I mean that's what, a, that's what a explosive is if you think about it. If I throw a hand grenade into the room it will bounce around classically right, and land on the floor but why does it scare the crap out of you? Because it's got a lot of stored potential energy, it's chemical, and it'll go off, okay? So this is essentially the same idea. Cool. Um, should I update it? And I had to run that because my computer was so slow. We don't know what the resulting modifications will be though. So whereas the hand grenade you know is probably gonna, well, let's assume there are no people in the room, going to blow up the furniture or whatever, um, when you're talking about a hand grenade that's the size of an atom, the question is what are the resulting modifications when you detonate it at a surface and can we use that in any way? So we need to spend a little bit of time giving a definition. So these is, this is highly charged ions is what we're talking about. So basically there's not a good definition out there. A uh, highly charged ion is just anything that carries enough potential energy that it's kind of like outside of what you're used to. Okay. So what you're used to probably is from your chemistry class or from your basic, uh, even physical, physical science class in high school is uh, the ionization potential of hydrogen. Anybody know that? Nobody? 13.6 EV, sound familiar? Or something? Yeah, 13.6, right. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the number that you, you think about it in terms of EVs is something on the order of 10. And so if we get ions that are basically significantly above that level, then they're sort of outside the regime of what we're used to. Because we pretty much know, like I send in a beam of hydrogen ions, it's not going to do much in terms of uh, potential energy. You don't see tiny explosions occurring when you throw protons at a surface, which is basically what hydrogen ions are. But if you go significantly above that, other stuff happens. Okay? And so that's where the new science of highly charged ion comes in. The, term we use is neutralization energy because essentially what's happening is you're taking an ion 
which in some cases could be a fully stripped nucleus. Okay, so it's a take the atom of your favorite element and pull all the electrons off and then say, all right, how much energy does it take to put all the electrons back on? So if it was hydrogen, it would take 13.6 EV and you would have a neutral hydrogen. Of course, if you have a highly charged ion, there's a whole bunch of electrons you have to add on. You need to add all those numbers up. That's the neutralization energy. And if you look at those energies, it gets big really fast. So first, this is a plot of the ionization energies. This is plotted in keV. So this is thousands of EVs. This is a log scale. Okay, so this is 100, 1,000, 10,000. And you can see your hydrogen is down here. Okay, the one that you're used to in the laboratory setting. And most of the ions that you use in industry and any ion that you come across in, in, in any sort of setting in most laboratories is right here. Okay, but if you deal with a highly charged ion, what you find is that as you pull off each electron, you're basically having to impart at least the ionization energy to that thing to get that electron off. So you're moving up this chart. You can see you're moving into the thousands. And then if you say, all right, now I've taken an, an atom and say it's out here in the 40s or something. So it's taken me hundreds and now thousands of electron volts of energy to get all the electrons off of this thing. And so now I have this ion, which I've basically imparted a lot of energy to. Okay, now all of the electrons got knocked off. You say, well, is it really there? It is because now what you need to do, math class, integrate this curve up to that point. And the integral up to that point of that charge state is the neutralization energy. That's how much energy you'll get back if you put all the electrons back into that, into that ion. And if you look at a plot of that, it doesn't really matter what element you use, but the favorite one for a lot of people in this field is xenon. Doesn't matter if you use the uranium is now this is the charge state, also on a log scale. Out here, charge 40 or so. So this is four above the 10, so 40. You can see that that integral ends up being something on the order of 20, 30, 40,000 electron volts. Okay, so this is well above that 10 EV limit that we're used to in laboratory setting. Question is, we don't know what that's gonna do, okay? Now, the basic physical picture you should have of what's going to happen, and there's been about 10 or 15 years of research into this, is the following, which is your ion's gonna come in, so from the left in this picture, this is the solid that it's gonna interact with, whatever the target is. First thing that's gonna happen is, from your E&M course, it's gonna create an image charge of itself. Okay, so there's gonna be positive ion comes in and then a negative thing comes up below. It's the mirror image of it below that's actually going to exert a force and drag it into the surface like this, by the way. You can actually solve that problem. But what's more interesting is, well before it actually gets to the target, it's gonna start picking up electrons. <clears throat> the problem is it's not gonna pick them up the way you pick them up when you solve the periodic table thing in your high school class. If you remember 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, all that kind of stuff. Well, it's, it's not that neat. It's not gonna say, okay, give me a 1s and a 2 and a 3 and a 4. What's gonna happen is, it's gonna pick them up just like in the magnetic tunnel junction device by tunneling out of this spot onto this entity, which is the ion, and it's gonna tunnel, but tunneling is only gonna happen between levels and energy which are basically the same, okay? It turns out that for most solids, those are not the little electron energy levels right around the nucleus. It's not the 1s2, the 2s2, it's like the 8f something or other, or the 10 whatever, okay? So it's really high, numbers, which means they're really far away from the nucleus. So what happens is, this positively charged nucleus comes flying in, electrons come streaming out of the target, but they go into this big shell outside the nucleus, okay? And when you get what's called a hollow atom. Now you have the nucleus, you have all these empty levels that need to be filled, and then you have all these electrons hovering on the outside. It's called an, also called an inverted population. It's kind of like a laser. Now you've flipped all the charges above where they need to be and they're going to have to start cascading back down and they're going to emit all sorts of stuff like x-rays. Okay, so it's almost like a tiny microscopic x-ray laser. They're also going to kick off some of the extra electrons just to conserve energy. So there's going to be this spray of charges and x-rays that come off and eventually you're going to hit the target. Okay, but all this actually happens before you hit the target. Chances are that you actually won't complete this process before you hit the target and it will continue as this ion goes into the solid, okay? But if you think about it, this thing is about how big? 
Any guess? How big is an atom? Yeah, maybe an angstrom or two, right? So let's just say an angstrom, okay? So 10 to the minus 10 meter, okay? And now let's say I send an ion, but it's actually asking for 40 electrons, okay? So how big of a spot at the surface do you think it's going to take those 40 electrons out of? Any guess? Yeah, yep. So basically, take a radius vector, draw it down, and draw a circle underneath it that's the same distance. That's sort of the area underneath the atom that's going to start trying to pull the electrons out of the surface. Okay? So if you were to sit down and do this problem, you would say, like, all right, so that's so many charges over so much area over how much time. It's actually about a few femtoseconds. If you work that out, the current density for that, and try to run that current through a wire, say in the walls of this room, you of course set the building on fire. Um, because this is basically equal to sort of the energy densities that you would get for a petawatt laser. So there's this billion dollar laser in Texas, right, that they're shooting into targets trying to like make fusion. The amount of energy you're depositing here in a spot the size of an atom is huge. Okay, so this is like each atom is delivering like a little laser shot of a billion dollar laser to the surface. Now, the other question is, imagine that's an insulator, okay? This thing came down and took 44 electrons out of an insulator. So what's the difference between an insulator and a conductor? Kind of in the name, but... It's a lot harder to get electrons off the insulator. It's a lot harder, why? Because they're, they're more tightly bound and associated with specific atoms. Right, so do you know what their purpose is then in the insulator? So obviously in a, they're not, some of them aren't tightly bound in a conductor, which is why they're used for conduction. But what about an insulator? What are they tightly bound, what are they doing? Right, so the material is actually strung together by the bonds, which are those electrons. And now I've actually come up to a spot the size of atom and I've said, could I have all those electrons please? Right, and I've piled them onto the atom. What do you think the surface is going to do? Break. Break, yeah, basically you've pulled out all the glue that held the atoms together, plus essentially you've made that spot positively charged. So what's going to, ions going to do? Poof, right? They're basically going to repel each other. And so the results, at least on a surface, which the people I see, is that each little spot where you actually hit the surface, there's a little explosion site at the surface. You actually blow little divots in these. These are both insulating targets. This one on the right is interesting. That's actually a piece of gold. That's an STM image. And you can imagine that that material probably is happy to give up its electrons because it's a conductor. Uh, but it's still got a lot of energy imparted to it, so much so that actually this little spot reformed into some special crystalline structure, which looks like you gave it just enough energy for it to melt and recrystallize into a perfect little crystalline mound. Okay? And this sort of stuff is seen. There's galleries and galleries of these things. And we still don't understand exactly the, the physics, the chemistry, all the material science of this problem. But these, these are the sort of things that happen under each one of these impact sites. Okay. So this is the basic physics of, of highly charged ions. And you can actually see then, um, if you look at mass removal as a function of the kinetic energy of the beam, you'll notice that, first off, this is a function of kinetic energy. These are HCI, so this is xenon all the way up to 28 or so. The lines are pretty flat. It means it doesn't really care much about the velocity or the energy, the kinetic energy. So unlike the singly charged ions, it doesn't matter that much how much classical physics I, I'm imparting. It's all this potential energy of these different ions that's changing the position of these lines. And so in terms of the mass removal, you're removing thousands and thousands of AMUs of material from this insulating target for each ion impact. Okay, so you're making huge craters at the surface, basically. So if we want to do this now and go back to the beginning of what I was talking about. So now we actually want to like use a magnetic tunnel junction device. And uh, step one is, let's grow half of it, okay? So let's have a copper cobalt, and let's put a little insulator on top of it. So this is aluminum oxide, okay? So we'll grow it. And then we'll irradiate it with these ions, okay? So now we know what's going to happen is we get a hollow atom. It's actually going to K 
kick off some material, it's actually going to pass through the target. That doesn't matter really, but these are pretty high energy beams that we're using in this experiment. So they actually just shoot all the way through the target and come out the other side. We don't care. What's important is that what you're going to be left with is that. Okay? So you're actually going to make a little crater in this insulating layer that you grew on this magnetic tunnel junction device. So step three is you just then deposit your ferromagnet. So this is my ferromagnet, my insulator, and my ferromagnet. This is my tunnel junction device. But now it's been modified by highly charged ions. And if you look at this then, what you can see is this is a plot of DVDI. So if you know Ohm's law, that's an upside down version of depending on which way you think of it. But this is basically then a, a plot of the uh, tunneling resistance as a function of bias between those two layers. And what this plot shows you is that for unirradiated device you get a curve that looks like that. Okay? And this is a signature then that, th that this is actually tunneling. So that, that shape that you see. Then for the device that we hit with the HCIs, you can see we still get that shape. So it's still tunneling, which means I didn't obliterate all of my insulator. It's not like I, imagine if I had irradiated with HCIs and all of that oxide had come off, then I would have two ferromagnets stuck together, okay? And this would no longer give you this shape, it would be some flat line. So the fact that you see this shape means it's still tunneling. What it also means though is that we've changed the overall resistance of this device by hitting it with ions. You can see that that curve is now in a different spot on that graph. Okay? So what we actually get then is a selectable conductance. So we can actually change the conductivity depending on the charge state. So this is xenon 34, xenon 40, xenon 44, and also the number of ions that I, I send in. So you can see that depending on the number I send in, these are basically lines, which means that each ion does something. That's why it's linear. But also you see the lines have different slopes. So each ion does something, but it depends on whether the ion is charge 34, 40, or 44. So what you essentially get is you're getting a conductance change per number of ions. That's the slope of each one of these lines. So if you look at the slope of each one of those lines, and then you plot it, so this is actually the conductance, which is the slope of those lines, this conductance change per ion, as a function of the neutralization energy or up here, the charge state, both of them are on here, of the xenon ions, you can see we get this change which is one, two, three or so orders of magnitude that we can basically turn the knob on the conductance of this magnetic tunnel junction device just by choosing the charge state of the ion that we send in. Okay. Now this is a highly rarefied condition obviously although there's a patent on this no industry people are knocking down the door yet. But, but this is a, at least one example now where you can actually use highly charged ions to do something that you wouldn't be able to do with any other type of ion. Okay? And if you're interested why it gives you this effect, it is basically has to do with the amount of energy in this plot here that's going into the surface. So it's really just a problem where you say like, I have this much energy and I need to dissipate it in this target and I need to dissipate it over an area that's about this big underneath each one of these atoms and it just adds up that way that it's linear with each number of ion but it depends on the bucket. How big of a potential energy bucket? How big of a hand grenade did I throw in there to blow a hole in this thing? So where do we go from here? So this is uh, getting closer to your uh, tour date on Thursday with the high schoolers. So, if we wanted to do HCI modified MTJs, I didn't tell you that all that work that, that I showed you just now on the highly charged ions wasn't done at Clemson. It was actually done in Washington DC at the National Institute of Standards and Technology where they have this thing called an EBIT. Um, so, but now Clemson has one. Okay. And uh, so we have a new facility on campus which can create these kinds of ions. And so that's the facility you're going to visit uh, in a couple of days. And that's next door to where Nathan works actually. So, um, just in case you want to know the background of this thing, it's an expensive toy. They gave us money about four years ago. It took us that long to actually get the thing on the ground. It was a little over one and a half million dollars. Uh, and finally, last summer, we turned it on. So, uh, unfortunately, the last summer's REU student was sitting around as we were sort of tinkering and we didn't actually turn it on. But now it's running, so you're lucky in that sense. Um, so, I thought I'd spend some time telling you what it is, okay? Because otherwise, you're going to like look through the window and be like, that looks cool. 
Uh, I guess that's expensive, huh? Looks expensive. Uh, so I'll walk you through what an EBIT is so when you look through the window, you actually understand it. So um, in an atomic physics sense, this is a toy that was built by atomic physicists over 20 years ago. Okay? And the reason they built it is because the fact that, as I said, highly charged ions create x-rays. And so if you actually go out into space and you turn an x-ray telescope and look around space at all the different stars that are out there, you see tons of x-rays. You don't see those in the ground because the atmosphere shields us from x-rays. But basically all of the stars out there are emitting x-rays all the time. Uh, and it's because inside a star it's really hot. And so essentially inside the star all the electrons get boiled off of the atoms and they basically become highly charged inside the stars and then they emit x-rays. And that those x-rays, because they're tied to those open orbitals really close to the nucleus, they're exact signatures of the elements that are in the stars. So astronomers are crazy about this stuff. I'm not an astronomer. I'm in a department with astronomers. I actually don't like astronomers that much. Um, cause, just because they do really cool stuff and everyone loves it, and so they come to do phys physics and astronomy, but then you realize like, they don't make any money. <laughs> so so uh, it's funny that, that uh, you know, most of the physicists I know hate astronomers. But it's not mutual because we pay the bills. Um, but they built this toy so they could basically make these ions on the ground. Okay? So they, they designed this thing so they could say, like, you know what, we, we got to see all these x-rays and we don't know what any of these things are. So we need to basically make a small star in the laboratory where all the electrons are, are boiling off so we can actually record all the x-rays. So they spent over a decade or two recording x-rays out, out of this device and then said, what are we going to do with it? Oh, hmm, now that we're done, we can turn it over to the other physicists or the material scientists. So that's why we have one now. It's because now you start asking questions like, I wonder what happened if these ions, which only exist in space, interacted with materials targets. Maybe something cool would happen, like craters and stuff, as you've seen. So the guts of this machine are also here. This piece here is here. The basic idea is in the name. So this EBIT stands for Electron Beam Ion Trap. And so what you have here is three little tubes, just a hole down the middle. They're just three circles, basically. That's the trap. That's the T part, the ion trap. And this is a cathode emitter for an electron gun. So this is basically just something that shoots out electrons. And what happens is you shoot an electron beam right through the center of these three disks. Okay? And most of it does nothing. So actually if you turn on the electron beam in our lab, most of it flies through and hits this big copper plate down at the end and creates a hell of a lot of heat and if you look in the lab you're going to see water pipes everywhere because we're trying to keep it cool. Okay? But if you leak a little bit of gas into this region right here in the middle and it's very diffuse and you shoot the electron beam through that gas, it'll, some of it will impact ionize that gas and it'll start knocking electrons off of that gas. And so this is how you start knocking electrons off of the atoms. Now you want to make that really efficient, so you want that electron beam to be really dense as possible. So what you do is you surround the whole thing in a superconducting magnet. And uh, what you'll find is that actually takes your electron beam and squeezes it even tighter in the middle region. So we have a magnet like this, it's a six Tesla magnet in the laboratory, so I doubt any of you have pacemaker, so you shouldn't worry. Um, and if you're not careful, your tools will fly into the machine and, and damage it. So uh, you try to use non-magnetic tools. But basically then you can have a high density electron beam right in the center that can ionize the gas. And then what you do is those three elements, those three tubes that are right here, you put a voltage on them such that the middle one has a slightly lower voltage than the ones on the outside. So in terms of your e &M physics, uh, physics 2 probably, the energy landscape that those ions see is the charge times the voltage, Q times V. And so it's a little bit higher here and a little bit lower here and you basically made a little bottle, okay, where the ions get trapped and they can't go left or right. They're stuck right in the middle. So you can imagine what's happened. You basically line the ions up and they're stuck in the middle and you just keep shooting them with the electron beam until you knock all of the, all of the charge off. And then you know that because the depth of this potential well for, the, for these ions is dependent on the charge Q, that as the Q goes up, this thing gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for the higher charge state. So they just get piled in there and they can't get out. Okay? So this is a perfect tool then for doing atomic physics 
for stars because then you just poke a window, a hole in the side of this machine and you just look inside at this little bit of stuff and there's all these x-rays and stuff coming out. So this is what the machine was originally designed for. Now what we're doing of course is we want to shoot it at a target. So all you have to do then is take one of these, so let's say it's the one on this side, and just change this voltage ever so slightly, maybe tilt it, or maybe go like this, uh, 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 and open the door every so often. And what happens is you'll just let the ions come popping out. So this is actually how we make an ion beam. We just release them out of the trap every so often. So we can do a release and then build it back up and then release it, or we can actually just tilt it so they just kind of boil over the edge. They kind of hop over the edge. And that will make a, an ion beam out of these highly charged ions. So we went shopping um, in Germany for one of these machines. So this is a machine in, in Dresden, uh, Germany that we bought. As I said, it has a six Tesla magnet. If you're standing in the hallway for your tour, you're going to hear this sound like this. That is a closed cycle uh, helium cooled compressor. One of these machines, uh, in order for you to keep this magnet really cold, which is basically at four Kelvin, so it's superconducting, uh, you got to use helium. Uh, but helium is really expensive. So if you've ever worked in a lab with helium uh, and you ever spill it on the floor, you know you probably got fired uh, because each container of helium costs about $1,000. So normally a machine like this would cost you one to $2,000 a day to run, uh, which is why we would probably never have one at Clemson, except that now that this company has, this, has made it so that they basically built a refrigerator which uses helium and just uses it again and again and again kind of like the refrigerant in your refrigerator at home. And so because of that, it, it can cool this thing down to four Kelvin, but it has to run all the time. What's interesting is when you look into the lab, the superconducting magnet will be on uh, because we're running it, um, which means there's a current flowing in the magnet, right? Um, but it also, you'll notice, you probably won't notice from outside the window, but it's not actually hooked up to a power supply. Um, because once you get the current flowing, there's no resistance in the wire. So why do you have to have the power supply anymore? So you can actually unplug it and the current just sits and flows in the magnet like this uh, continuously. That's superconductor, right? So no resistance. So we've got like 100 amps just going in a circle here perpetually, as long as we keep it cold. Um, inside we have a drift tube, which is basically those three sections. The middle one for us is about 20 centimeters. That's important to some people in this field. It means ours is kind of long. Uh, some people like to have really small traps because they want to look at right at the center with the window and do atomic physics, but we're ion beam people, so we wanted a big one. Um, and so this is the design. There's a big refrigerator on top, which you'll see in the lab looks like that, with big uh, braided hoses coming down the side. That's what's carrying the compressed helium into this refrigerator. This refrigerator is here, and then it's actually got a four, four Kelvin terminal down here, which is wrapped around and touching the magnet. The magnet coils are hanging in the center of the machine. You'd, the, two, the drift tubes, we only have three, are right like that. And here's the electron beam. So the electron beam shoots right down the center, hits this thing called the electron collector. As I said, it's just a piece of copper. The electrons just spray out and get dumped there. But what you can also do is, right in the same path that the electrons come out, we can release the ions out of the trap and they come out the end. Okay? So this is, uh, basically there's electrons and ions flying together. The electrons go like that to the collector and the ions keep going. And then we would just release them down this tube and that's the beam line where we actually uh, make our beams. So if you're looking in the lab, so you guys know what the heck you're looking at, you guys are going to be standing out here outside this window. I don't know why they can't come inside. Maybe it's because it's so loud. You can come inside. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, these guys can come in, right? They won't get electric. And the EBIT uh, itself, uh, you'll see in the window is this thing right here. So this is our EBIT. Um, and it shoots down this way. You'll see a big blue piece there. That's a, that's a bending magnet, so we actually have to shoot the ions out. But what happens when you open that trap, as you can imagine, is it's every charge state that was created inside the EBIT. So if it was xenon, it would be xenon 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, everything. Which is not very useful if I'm trying to do like a physics experiment and I only want to use one of those charge states. So what I do is I actually turn it 90 degrees through another magnet, and that magnetic field is set, if you remember QV cross B, and all that stuff you did on a test probably one time, is that only one of them, based on the magnetic field, will make it around that turn. So I can use that magnet to choose which one I want. It's actually charged to mass ratio, so I can also choose the mass, because it turns out it's not, this machine is not purely running on the gas I put in. There's other stuff in there, like stuff from the air. There we actually get nitrogen and oxygen beams without even asking for them. 
Um, there's an old guy that sits there. Uh, <laughs> he's not here, right? But there's a room here, and you'll probably see a guy sitting behind the window. So we actually sit on the other side because of high voltage, because of noise. Uh, um, we, we run from the control room. Um, there is a big project in the corner that's probably my next generation of grad students project. This is what I call phase three, which is uh, there's actually a big, people let's say it looks like a diving bell. It's a diving bell with a robot on top of it. It's basically a target chamber for holding targets in front of that beam and moving them around. Um, it's just I haven't had time to actually get it running yet. So we keep putting on ever uh, more complicated target chambers in the hopes that we'll get to that one eventually. Um, and, and then finally in the corner, because we want to do device physics, there's actually a whole machine just for evaporating thin films. So just for doing device uh, fabrication. Um, probably your tour won't involve it, but there's other stuff in the building to, to, that was required to run this machine. For instance, uh, you actually, over in the corner you'll, of that lab, actually you'll see a, a, a giant white box. That's a huge water chiller, which is also why the lab is so loud. It runs deionized water. Any guess as to why we have to use deionized water? It's nasty stuff if you ever use it. It'll eat through anything because it's taking ions from stuff because it's deionized. Nobody has a guess. So we have to cool our machine. We have to run water through it. Um, but you can also imagine this machine in order to accelerate these ions and get them down the way, there's voltages everywhere. Um, if I have ions in my water that runs through my machine that's at high voltage, then basically my water serves as a resistor and I drop my voltage across my water. So your water can actually form a resistor uh, for your machine and mess up all your electronics. So the way to get around that is you have to basically use water that has no ions in it. So there's no chance of dropping voltage across your water. So I didn't realize this until I bought this machine. So I wouldn't expect you to know that. Um, also down the hall, we actually had to like gut a room down the hall just to get all the heat out of the room. There's this huge section of crazy pipes and stuff, which is actually hooked into the campus's water, chilled water system. So it's the big pipes that run all over campus, uh, just so we can keep the lab cool. Okay. Uh, and out back, if the power ever goes out, which it does in Clemson at least three times uh, every summer or so, there's a generator. But we're happy that we have it, so we show it off. So just to summarize, okay. Um, hopefully uh, I brought you up to speed on some kind of device, which is the magnetic junction devices, either GMR, giant magnetoresistance devices, or the tunneling variety, the tunnel needle resistance device. Showed you a little bit about ion-solid physics, so specifically what's the difference between a singly charged ion and a highly charged ion? Kinetic energy versus potential. That's the take-home message. Um, or if you need a more colorful, no hand grenade, hand grenade. Okay, that's another way to think of it. Uh, and then I uh, showed you the lab, which you'll see, which is the EBIT laboratory. So this is the one which operates off electron impact ionization, basically machine gun ions to knock the electrons off, and then you get an EBIT lab, which is what we have at Clemson. Okay? All right. Questions? I actually have a question. Yeah. I hadn't thought about this until you talked about the, the hollow ion. Hollow. hollow. The hollow picture. That's the general physical picture one. This one. Right. So, so when that ion is approaching the surface of the target, and it starts uh, neutralizing by drawing electrons off out of that material, and they they first find a position in some of these outer Lindbergh um, states or whatever, yep. does it, is, is, the, is the state, the orbital that they occupy a function of the ion or is it always going to be about the same? It's a function of that. That's actually, it's actually cute physics. It actually goes as, so, so if you remember atomic physics, the N, so when you say 1s2, 2s2, 3s2, the n is that number in front, so the 1, the 2, the 3. The n that you go to is roughly, so I'm drawing an approximate symbol, approximately uh, equal to the q. Um, so charge 44 will actually go into like the n equals 44. That's the first set of electrons that come out. So it basically is going to go to the valence shell. Oh, it's, <laughs> yes. 
it's going to the valence shells way out there. So this is like a, a wacko state that you don't normally find. And so you can imagine this thing is actually pretty big on the scale of atoms. That's why it's drawn like this. And, and so this thing actually, people have done calculations because theorists can make really cool pictures that you wish you could actually see in an experiment. But you see this hollow atom and then it comes to the target but then that, that orbital, which isn't really like that, but as a physicist you can get away with it, right? It looks like this big sphere out there and it gets deformed and like breaks apart as you hit the surface. And so these secondary electrons, a lot of them are just because this thing touched the surface and just went right and it blew off all of those, those outer shells and they have to get refilled again. Right, and, and, uh, so, and this thing is partially neutralized, so it's still drawing in charge because these things don't really screen out the nucleus, so it still looks like it's a charge 44 with like some little bit of guys hanging out on the outside, so it's still trying to draw in electrons at the same time. It's a really complicated, messy problem. Yeah, well, you know, um, what will happen is you'll, you'll get them to cascade down. To conserve energy, you'll get x-rays. But there's a second process of side feeder, which you know, you know OJ processes. So OJ, if you don't know, is a two-electron process where um, I could drop down, but in order to conserve energy, another po possibility is, as opposed to just the Einstein photoelectric effect of kicking out a photon, which is the x-ray problem, is this is like kick off one of the other electrons. It's like, hey man, get out of here. It's, yeah. And so that's called OJ, named after Pierre OJ. It looks like auger, A-U-G-E-R, if you ever see it written down. And so you'll actually get characteristic, and those are very characteristic energy. So if you put a spectrometer out here and actually record these x-rays and these electrons, you'll see electrons with very specific energies come popping off your atom. And those are because they're getting knocked off because of these interatomic processes. So this is a weird mixture of Material science, surface physics with atomic physics all happening at the same time. Then you add in double E when you make a device, right? Question? Is there a reason you use Xenon? Because it's a, it's a nice easy gas to work with, and, but it gives you a relatively high charge state. So you can get all the way up to the, the noble gases are nice because they're not noxious. They're not going to usually kill you unless it's the only thing in the room, right? You can't breathe Xenon. But, uh, so, so, and it's relatively, well, it's not that cheap, but it gives you a, hu a huge range of charge states. Um, we actually haven't run xenon in our machine yet. We've only run argon, but again, another one of those noble gases on the far right of the periodic table. The reason that we haven't put xenon in is, is what we were told is that once you put it in, you never get rid of it. So, um, if we put xenon in the machine, we can open it up to the air, we can clean it, we can do everything, but we'll always have xenon ions coming out of our machine. It's just because they're so heavy that some of them will stick to the walls and when you fire the machine back up, they'll come off, they'll go back into your little trap in the middle, they'll get reionized, and they sit way down there in the trap. So they'll always be in there. And then you get what's called evaporative cooling. So if you know evaporative cooling, like from a pot of water on a stove, is uh, you, you start kicking off uh, uh, steam, right, in order to evaporatively cool the material. So that actually has a mass dependence to it. So if you have two masses and you do evaporative cooling, the lighter mass will leave first. So the, the reason that, that people say, like, don't run xenon until you're ready to is because it's heavier than most anything else you would run. And so once you get in there and you try to run something that's lighter, your lighter stuff will keep popping out of your trap before you're ready for it to be whatever charge state you want. So if I had xenon and argon, my argon would keep flying out of my trap to evaporatively cool the ions. It's a plasma thing. But so again, I guess there's another area. So plasma physics also fits in here. Well, it would be true for anything that's ma that massive, but unfortunately the mass and the charge state go together, right? <laughs> it's the, the proton number, the Z. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to be running iron and all sorts of craziness because we hired an atomic physicist. It's our fault. I'm happy to stick with medium charge states, but um, 
a lot of the cool, interesting, like crazy, wacky physics happens when you get up to like charge state 50 and 60. And I mean, if you want another far out experiment, the if you do the electric field calculations around one of these ions, you say like take xenon 50 something or or even uranium 80 something, and you actually figure out like how big is the electric field outside of that nucleus? It's so big that it can actually pull particles out of vacuum. If you've ever read that in like the you know, literature of like popular science or something where they say like, you know, there's, there's uncertainty around you uh, in terms of the energy of the background of, of the world, right? And so there's this little fluctuations, quantum fluctuations. So much so that you could pull particles out of space, out of, out of, and bring them into existence. Of course, they would be, they started off as pure energy fluctuations, so you have to bring them back in a pair, which is matter, antimatter. So these things are actually high enough that you can actually pull matter, antimatter pairs. They'll pull them out of the vacuum around them. Um, I don't know how that would play out in a material science experiment to be pulling antimatter into the thing, but that, that is one of the other interesting aspects is the high electric fields. Yes, yes. We, we, people have been asking us for two years if we're going to make a black hole on campus, if you're wondering. So, so far, no black hole. Nathan, no question. All right. Okay.